morning. Welcome to the service this morning, our worship time together. May God be glorified by our singing and by our meditations upon His Word this morning. Just a few announcements that are on the back of the bulletin that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, one is the ordination Sunday, uh, July 17th, to bring Mark to the, to the deacon. Something you should all be aware of to attend. And we have a church picnic being planned for Saturday, August the 27th, and I'm just going to go to follow along there. I want to have us turn for a call to worship to Psalm 67. Psalm 67 is a psalm, a psalm of praise, but it's also a psalm of a prayer for the church. Just reading the seven verses here. God be gracious to us and bless us. Cause his face to shine upon us, Selah. That your way may be known on the earth. Your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you will judge the peoples with uprightness and guide the nations on the earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may hear. Let's just go to prayer, asking God's blessing upon our time together. Father, we again would thank you for this time that we can gather, worship you, praise you. Uh, we would pray this morning that your hand would be upon us on our service together. We pray as the Psalms says, pray that your face would indeed shine upon us when we worship you. Father, give us, give us eyes to see, uh, grant us our ears to hear, and we understand your greatness, your majesty, your dominion, your love, your care, your justice, your holiness that is always towards us. We are great sinners, Father, but we worship a great God. Be with us this morning, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Please take your blue hymn, most your blue hymn. We'll turn to hymn 35 in your blue hymn, most. We'll be our first hymn we'll sing together. We'll stand and sing in praise and glory to his great name. Now unto the King eternal, mortal and visible, the only wise God, the honor and glory forever and ever.
number 93, again in your blue hymnals. This is a hymn that speaks of our weakness, speaks of our doubts, but it also speaks of God's sovereign rule over all things. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It says in verses, looking at verses 26 46, he says here, he talks again about the institution of the Lord's Supper, this great gospel ordinance. He says, he says, Our Lord knew well the things that were before him, and he graciously chose this last quiet evening that he would, before his crucifixion, his disciples, he's with his disciples, and so it's before the crucifixion, and he chooses this, this evening to speak to them, and he's bestowing this, this gift, this parting gift on the church. It's a precious gift that he's left the church. It's how precious, Ryle says, must have his ordinance have appeared afterwards to his disciples when they remembered the events of that night. Then he goes on to say this, which I thought was rather interesting. He says, yet sadly, he writes, again, this is Ryle, how mournful is the thought that no ordinance, no ordinance of a church has led to such fierce controversy and been so grievously misunderstood as the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. It's an ordinance that he says should have united the church, but our sins have made it an occasion of great division. The thing which should have been for our welfare has been off too often for our own harm. The occasion for harm is the ordinance, Lord's Supper. 
And then secondly, he looks at verses 36 to 46. He talks about the agony of, of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I can remember as we went through this a number of months ago or years ago, John MacArthur describes this as the torture chamber, the torture chamber that Christ faces in the garden. He's placed in the torture chamber. It would always help you to understand what happens in the garden here is that in a sense, the cup of wrath has been placed in front of Christ. In a sense, it's in his hands. And he looks, he peers into that cup, that cup of wrath while he's in the garden. And that's why you see him enter this, this portion of agony as he falls to the ground. He falls numbers, numerous times to the ground and he sweats great drops of blood. And this is what Ryle says here. We read of Christ's agony in Gethsemane. It is a passage, he says, which undoubtedly contains deep and mysterious things. And we ought to read it, he says, with reverence and wonder, for there is much here that we will never fully understand. So let us begin then by reading starting at verse 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing too. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved and distressed. And then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went out again a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Get up, let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. We're going to go to a time of prayer. We're going to remember Pastor Bodner. As many of us know, he's struggling with cancer going to a cancer treatment for chemo and radiation so we need to pray for him and his family. We'll also make mention of Mike and Heather. We can mention today they left they were traveling to Manitoba. We're going to ask God's blessing upon them. Traveling can be a time of great anxiety so we'll pray for them for, for some peace as they travel back and forth. Then we're going to ask God's blessing upon Juan and Destiny Friday, they will be married, have their wedding ceremony. We're going to ask for God's blessing upon them that they might reflect Christ in their marriage together. So let us let us go to God in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come this morning, we come acknowledging that you indeed are a great God, the only God. 
And Father, you sit upon your throne, you rule, you sovereignly rule this universe. And you are clothed in splendor and majesty. You are the God of the Bible. You are the God of all creation. You are the creator, the creator of man. You are the creator of each one of us. Indeed, Father, you are worthy of our praise, you are worthy of our worship and our reverence. And sadly, Father, sadly our eyes are dim, and sadly we do, not, we do not see you as we ought, we do not honor you as we ought. And Father, this morning uh, we will pray for your presence, we will pray for your smile upon us, your face that would shine upon us as we worship you and the truth of your word. Help us, Father, help us praise you. Help us to sing with great joy. Help us, as the psalmist has said, help us to fear your name and help us to make your name known. Father, we've been reminded uh, this morning of the great agony of your son in the garden. He became our sin bearer. He became sin for us. What love, what mercy, God would die for sinful, undeserving man. That God would die for each one of us to worship a great God who welcomes a great sinner. And Father, this morning we would pray to your servant, Pastor Bodner. May you strengthen him and may you help him through this difficult trial that he now faces. Help him with his suffering. Help him with his pain and guide his doctors. And Father, may he glorify you. May he glorify you in this difficult trial as he walks through this dark valley. Be with him. Be with his family. May they be comforted. May they be strengthened. May they have a sense of your presence. That indeed you are their refuge. And Father, we also pray for. Mike and Heather, this morning as they travel, may you grant them travel mercies, may you grant them a peace, may you grant them a freedom from anxiety as they bring their mother home safely. And Father, we'd also think today of Juan, Juan and, and Destiny, we pray for them, we pray as they enter into that sacred ordinance of marriage. May your presence be there, Friday with them. May your name be held up. May your name be honored in their ceremony and in their celebration together. And help them, Father. Help them to be a true reflection, a true reflection of your love, your mercy, your grace. And Father, this day we would pray for ourselves as we worship here at Grace Baptist. We pray for your word as it is preached in our midst. May it be heard, may it pierce, may it convict, may it strengthen, may it also encourage your people. Father, give Pastor John strength of mind and voice as he preaches your word. We ask all of us in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please take your red hymnals, your red hymnals. Turn to hymn number 27. Number 27 is red hymnals. It's a hymn that speaks of God's greatness, the greatness that's displayed in creation, his greatness that's displayed in salvation. O great and mighty God, great in counsel, and mighty in need.
Well, let's take our Bibles now and turn to a passage that reminds us of the greatness of God, Isaiah chapter 40, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah chapter 40. As you go into the week, we've already prayed for some important things that we need to continue praying for. Please also remember to keep praying for Dean and Julie. Julie continues to struggle physically. She's waiting right now on tests uh, that apparently were sent to labs in Toronto and uh, eager to find out what they have to say. So please uh, continue to lift them up before the Lord. We're going to be focusing on the end of Isaiah chapter 40 on the complaint that Israel brings to the Lord and his response to them. But we need to read the entire chapter to see this in context, and it's a wonderful chapter to, to read and think on. So let's begin in Isaiah 40 and verse 9. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her, that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop before uh, from a bucket, and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. 
Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his power, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even you shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, let's again look to God in prayer. Our Father, here we are before you, and we're waiting for you to speak through your word. We pray that you would come to us and make this ancient prophecy to be a living word for us this morning. Bring this promise to our minds and our hearts that we might trust you for all that we need for the rest of our lives. Our Father, we acknowledge we need your word. We need your spirit to work in our hearts and help us to depend upon you day after day. For we confess that we are a very needy people and we need all that you have promised to give to us. Thank you that every promise is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every promise is yes and amen in our Savior. And so may we lean upon him this morning for what we need. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of weeks ago on vacation, I had the opportunity to talk with two workmen. And when they found out I was a pastor, they asked what I did, they got really excited, which is a rather unusual response. When people find out I'm a pastor, um, they usually say, oh, now we've got to behave or something like that. Well, these men were really excited and proceeded to tell me that they were both Christians. And yet our conversation went in the direction of how much the pandemic had impacted them. In fact, both of them had quit going to church. One of them had gotten started again, and he was all excited to tell me about that. But the other man uh, acknowledged that he still wasn't going back to church. Clearly, what had gone on over the past two years had impacted their relationship with God. They knew that and that it was an ongoing situation. I think that's a familiar story for many people that could be repeated over and over again. A health emergency that became a chronic situation impacting government and borders and finances and travel and how people view and attend church. Many people even still are struggling to get back to a meaningful relationship with a local church. Many people have determined that it's easier to sit at home in their pajamas and just watch something on TV. Others have just given it up as something unnecessary. One of the complaints that I have heard the most is how tired people are how this two years of constant bombardment 
about a medical crisis has left them feeling very weary. The struggle to get back to routine has been difficult. And as you reflect over the past two years, it's amazing how we can be so tired doing less. I think this is a great challenge for God's people. For as we've already seen in previous messages, we've got to get back to a regular schedule of worship and fellowship and service to the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many things over the past two years were left undone. And as God's people, we don't want that to become our normal schedule. We need to gather as God's people because this is where we experience the blessing of the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to gather together so that we can fellowship and encourage one another. The very nature of the church demands our gathering since the church is an assembly of God's people that God has called out of the world. We're a body. We're a spiritual building, a fruitful vine that cannot exist in isolation from one another. <clears throat> so I want us to take up this question this morning. Where do we get the energy to do in these days all that God has called us to do? Where do we find the vigor and the spiritual zeal for worship? Brethren, there's nothing worse than dead, lifeless worship. To gather together and just go through the motions of what might be biblical worship. It's going to just leave us bored and not zealous to come here. So what can we do to make sure that we come and as we take up the worship of God and the study of his word and, and focus our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the great salvation that he has won, how can we do that with zeal and spiritual energy that will bring glory to God and send us on our way saying, this was a day of worship and glory to God. I want it again. How do we stir up desires for prayer on a Wednesday night after a long day of work? How do we envision adding more works of service to church life? Giving ourselves to discipling activities, helping young Christians to grow, pouring our efforts into evangelism. We've got lots of empty seats here. Would we be burdened to see them filled? That people might hear the gospel, the good news, that they too can be saved and look forward to a heaven, an eternity in heaven with God knowing his blessing. Are we going to give in to weariness that we may feel? Or will we believe that there is a way to obtain spiritual vigor and strength that we need to pursue? Those are some of the various, the very issues that ancient Israel was struggling with. They weren't facing a pandemic throughout the book of Isaiah. But the prophet was warning them about the coming judgments of God, the invasions and the exiles that they would experience as the Assyrian Empire and then the Babylonian Empire would sweep down into the Promised Land and take them off to a far country into a time of exile. The circumstances that they were going to face are far worse than anything that we have known even throughout COVID. This brought about their complaint to God, beginning in verse 27. We might summarize their words this way. God doesn't know what's happening to me. As Isaiah pictures them, 
going away into exile and experience all of the devastation of that time period, they're complaining to the Lord, God, you don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know the trials that I'm going through. My way is hidden from the Lord. And then they followed up that complaint by saying, God has forgotten about me. Not only doesn't he think about me, not only does he doesn't know what's going on in my life, he's forgotten about me. He's unaware of my situation and he's not concerned about it. He doesn't seem to care about what we're going through. That's often been the complaint of God's people throughout the ages. As they go through various trials, they conclude, well, God doesn't seem to care. He's not hearing my prayers. He's not coming to help me. He seems to be aloof to what I'm experiencing. This chapter blows that kind of thinking to pieces. It begins with a great gospel proclamation. As one writer puts it, a glorious change awaits the church, consisting in a new and gracious, gracious manifestation of Jehovah's presence, for which his people are exhorted to prepare. And so basically, there's this message at the beginning of the passage, God is coming. And God is coming in a way that he's never come before. And his glory is going to be made known. And we have those verses that are very familiar to us because of the gospel accounts of the coming of John the Baptist. How that one would come to prepare the way of the Lord. And the mountains would be taken down and the hills would come up. And there would be a straight way along which God would walk as he comes to save his people. And then this description of this mighty God as a shepherd who comes and ministers to his people. Even taking the lambs up into his arms and carrying them along and looking after them during their time of trial. And then it presents to us in a striking fashion through both questions and declarations the greatness of God in creation, the incredible wisdom he manifested in making the world, his immensity in contrast to the nations. What are the nations? They're like a drop in the bucket to God. You've had a bucket full of water and you'd empty them. And there's just a little bit left and so you turn it over and you see those last couple of drops come out. You think of billions of people in this world and compared to God they're just a couple of little drops in the bucket. So great is our God. The prophet goes on in speaking of the folly of worshipping anything else, of God's ongoing rule in this world, bringing great men who think that they are powerful down to nothing. And then at the end of this chapter, he deals with this complaint from Israel, saying, oh, God doesn't know what's going on with us, and God doesn't care what's happening to us. He deals with this complaint bringing them a most encouraging promise. Now it's this promise that we want to focus on this morning, a promise of strength for the weary. This, I believe, will help us to be able to put COVID behind us in terms of its spiritual impact and help us to summon zeal for the work of God's kingdom that is before us in the many years that God continues to give us health and strength. Well, let's consider what God has to say to his people in the final verses of this great chapter. First of all, there's the problem of human weakness or frailty. The problem of human weakness or frailty. Weakness, getting worn out, exhaustion, ready to faint. These are all words 
used by God here in this passage that describe our human condition. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have experienced words like this in your own life recently. And maybe even here this morning, some of you know exactly what God through the prophet is speaking about, that weariness that comes over us at times. We obviously feel this condition in various degrees. It ranges up from feeling tired because you haven't had a good night's sleep to that exhaustion which can result from a crisis in your life, a health breakdown, or a really strenuous time of work. So I was just pondering this. It made me remember an experience I had back at the beginning of my fourth year in college. I was attending college down in Virginia, and for my fourth year, I was going to be a resident assistant, and so we had to go back earlier than all of the other students. So I think we were there about a week early. So this is middle of August in hot southern Virginia. And the Dean of Students, who was in charge of all of the RAs, wanted to make sure we were in good shape, and so we had to join a running group. And so we're there, and I think the first day we have all of our meetings, and then uh, the end of the afternoon, we're all back to our dorms, changing so that we can go running together. I don't remember how far we ran. Again, the hot Southern Virginia sun. I came back to my dorm room and I fell on my bed and I felt like every ounce of energy had just gone from my body. Later, I think that night, Kathy phoned me. I'd been sick before I left Toronto Gone to the doctor, had some tests, found out I had mono. Well, I was exhausted. Not just that day, but for weeks. I got an exemption from the running for a little while until I was better so I could renew my strength. But you can have crises like that in your life where you just feel like everything is gone and you can't even put one foot in front of another. One of the amazing realities of this passage in which God displays his great power and glory is that he recognizes this human frailty. Against the backdrop of his power, God acknowledges our weakness and weariness. In verse 28, he speaks of the faint, of him who has no might, in verse 30, there's the recognition that this isn't simply a problem of old age when our health naturally declines, but even youth grow faint and weary, and young men become exhausted. The reference here may be to young men participating in athletic competitions or called into military service. And in these endeavors, they find their resources of energy completely depleted. It's a common human problem. The problem isn't so much that this happens to us. The problem is the results. When we get weary, our perseverance suffers. It's hard to keep going. Our zeal, our enthusiasm suffers and flags. We want to just sit down and give up and not do anything. This can happen in any area of life, but most critically, it can impact our spiritual life, our relationship with God, our concern for His glory and the cause of His kingdom in this world. We can get to a point where we just don't care about these things anymore. We may struggle to read the Bible, Prayer may become very weak and shallow. Going to church might feel like going through the motions. 
and any concern about the Great Commission or people going to hell in this world, that's just non-existent. It's not, it's not there in our minds, in our hearts. I think lots of Christians have felt like that because of COVID. The weariness has been evident. There's no vision for the future. There's no eagerness to get back to a normal spiritual life or even to excel in those spiritual disciplines that should mark our lives. That's why we need this promise that God has given to his people. It's the answer that will change our perspective and give new energy and zeal to our spiritual lives. Just a little sidelight before we go on. It's interesting to read through the Gospels and observe that the Lord Jesus experienced this kind of weariness. So it's not sinful to be faint and weary and tired and just exhausted. A couple of weeks ago, Al reminded us from Mark 4 that as Jesus and the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat, this terrible storm came up and the disciples, experienced fishermen, many of them were so afraid and Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat. He was exhausted. You read through those cha early chapters in the Gospel of Mark, and he was going early morning till late at night, ministering to people, performing miracles, teaching about the, the kingdom of God. He's a man in his early 30s, and he's exhausted. And then the Apostle Paul makes this unusual statement. In 2 Corinthians 13, as he's speaking about the Lord Jesus, he says, referring to Christ, he was crucified in weakness. As we saw in Psalm 22, he was like a jug of water poured out with nothing left to give. Well, we've got a Savior in heaven who knows what it's like to be weary to be tired, to be exhausted. And so he understands and sympathizes with us. And so here even God speaks of the problem of human frailty. Secondly, let's think about the promise of divine help. The promise of divine help. Again, here's this passage in which we're presented with a God of incredible power, a God who is immense, so he measures the waters of this planet in the palm of his hand. Now, we know that God doesn't have a hand. It's using human language to help us picture something. But imagine if a man could take the waters of all the oceans, all the lakes, all the rivers and streams and ponds and measure it in his hand. That man would have to be incredibly immense and great. That's how great God is. And with the span of his hand, he can measure the universe with all of the stars and all of the planets. Huh. We couldn't begin to do that. And towards the end of the chapter, we're reminded that God is the one who calls all of the stars out at night. And they're there because of his power. He's named them all. It would be easy for such a being of immensity and power to see our smallness and weakness and laugh at us and look down and say, what pitiful creatures I have made. But that's not what God does. Rather, he, uh, he doesn't mock us for our weakness. He doesn't call to us, don't be lazy, get going, what are you doing sitting around? Rather, as he recognizes human frailty, he gives us this promise of divine help. Look again at these encouraging words in verses 30 and 31. 
Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here is God promising the renewing of our strength. That when God, our strength is all gone and we're overwhelmed with weariness and weakness and frailty, God's promise is to renew our strength. In other words, in terms of your human life, when the gas tank is all used up, God promises to fill it up again. God promises to renew and replenish the supplies of our life. The strength will be there to accomplish all that God calls us to do. And then God gives us this wonderful picture of the eagle soaring in the sky. As you know, the eagle isn't your common neighborhood backyard bird. You don't often find an eagle sort of hopping around in your backyard. These are birds that, as the prophet reminds us here, they mount up into the sky. I did a quick Google search about eagles, and it's really fascinating to think about them. They can fly as high as to 20,000 feet above sea level. And up there on the air currents, they can fly along at speeds up to 60 miles an hour. And when, with their eagle eye vision, they look down and see their prey, they can dive down at speeds up to 75 miles an hour. That's incredible. In other words, God isn't simply pronouncing a little bit of strength when you get tired. He's not promising to renew us so that we can hop around like a robin in the backyard. When God gives you strength, he says, then you can soar like an eagle. And so God isn't just saying, I'll give you a little bit. I'll recharge your batteries 10%. No, he says, I'll give you strength. I'll give you energy more than you need. When God gives you energy, you soar like an eagle. His promise is a super abundance. He adds that such people who receive the Lord's help will be able to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint. If you run, you're going to be weary. You go for a two, three mile run, you're going to come to the end and you're going to want to sit down and just take a cold glass of water and do nothing. Here this promise is, those who wait on the Lord will run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Here are people who will know the Lord's help to be able to do these things. Previously they've been ready to keel over but with God's help, they can take up their tasks and excel. In the New Testament, we have such an incredible reminder in the life of the Apostle Paul. You remember in the book of 2 Corinthians, he lists all of those trials that he had gone through, trials that just zapped him of everything. And then on top of that, he got that thorn in the flesh. God knew that because of the many revelations he had received, there was the temptation to pride. And so God forestalled that 
by allowing Satan to give him this thorn in the flesh. And whatever it was, there are several different ideas about what it could have been, it left Paul in such a weakened state that he said basically, I can't go on in ministry. I can't do this. I can't be an apostle. I can't be a missionary. I can't travel from place to place. I can't preach on and on and on. I can't minister to churches. Lord, you've got to relieve me of this Lord in the flesh. And you remember Christ's response. No, Paul, I'm going to leave it right there. This is what you need. But in your weakness, I will provide for you all the strength that you need. So from now on, in his missionary labors, as he preached the gospel, as he established churches, as he traveled from place to place, he would know the power of Christ in his life. And so Paul was able to say, when I am weak, then. I am strong. He was a living testimony to this very promise that God had given many, many years ago. And dear brethren, that's what God can do for each one of us. Now we need to remember that this promise of renewed strength isn't for any and every reason. God isn't promising strength so that you can be a marathon runner or win an Ironman competition. This promise of strength is to help you fulfill the things that God has called you to do so that you will have the needed energy to do all the will of God. And brethren, it's amazing as you read through the scriptures how many examples of this there are. I've been reading lately in my own devotions through the history of Israel again. And I've been struck with this reality of how many old men were full of vigor in the service of God. Moses, his most beneficial leadership years, 80 to 120. Caleb and Joshua, 80 years old, embarking on their ministry. And Caleb at 80 is saying, I'm as strong now to serve the Lord as when I was young. I don't think that's just because they had unusual health from the Lord. I think it's because God was strengthening them, just like he promises. Here were men, they were mounting up with wings like eagles to do great things, even in their later years. So we're reminded of the promise or the problem of human frailty and the promise of divine help. And thirdly now, the process for obtaining this help. The process for obtaining this help. What are the means? How do we go about obtaining this help from God? What's the process? Well, God gives us here a very simple promise. It's a very simple formula. Look again at verses 30 and 31. Even you shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So it boils down to this. Here are the means. This is the process for obtaining this help. Those who wait for the Lord. Those who wait for the Lord. So obviously the critical question is, what does it mean to wait for God? Well, commentators will tell us that the language being used here was very common in ancient times. It was used to describe servants 
who were waiting on their master. So you get up in the morning, you get cleaned, you get dressed, you go and stand where your master is, and you wait for him to tell you what to do. You wait for him to give you an order. We can hear that kind of language in the Psalms. For instance, in Psalm 123 we read, To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he has mercy upon us. There you have this picture of servants waiting upon the Lord for their instructions. In modern times, we obviously don't have servants waiting on their masters, so we put it into modern terms, it might be comparable to expecting visitors to arrive at your home. For instance, when we lived in Mississippi, we were a long way away from our parents. And so they would often tell us they were coming to visit. And so that was always great news to our kids. Grandpa and Grandpa, this one or that one, they're coming to visit. And so it would involve several things as they waited for the grandparents to come. First of all, there was the confidence that they meant what they said, that they weren't teasing us, that they weren't holding a carrot out in front of us that would never come to pass. They had said they were coming to visit, so they were going to come to visit. Their word was true, and so we depended on that. And then there was the actual waiting and the watching on the calendar. We'd sometimes mark the day on the calendar, and so we could look and see when they were coming, and the kids, some of them would be saying, you know, is it gonna be tomorrow? Is it still next week? How long do we have to wait? There was that eagerness, that longing for them to come, and then when they finally came, the greetings and the thankfulness with which we welcomed them. Well, that gives us something of a sense of what it means to wait for God. So here again, we think about the context. It has to begin with the recognition of need. Because those who wait for the Lord, because he's coming with this promise of strength, they have to recognize how much they need that. And so there's the confession before the Lord. I'm just so weary. I'm just so tired. Just so worn out. I feel like I'm one ready to faint. Lord, I'm about to keel over. I need your help. So there's this recognition of our need. And so we come to God with this promise. And we think through the promise. I think it's so important that even though we've focused on the closing verses of this chapter, that we remember the God who spoke this promise. This God who has made the universe. This God who continues to rule in, in his providence. This God who has planned good things for his people. This God who has sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to bring about our salvation. This is the God who makes this incredible promise. And as we think about this God, we remember the promise and we actually receive it with belief. We acknowledge it is true that even though we're exhausted, weary, we don't know how we can put one foot in front of another, our God is the God who can come to us and he can renew our strength and he's able to make us mount up like an eagle. And so as we think upon that promise and think about the God who has made that promise, we come to him asking that he would fulfill the promise in our lives. We always need to remember the Bible is full of promises, but they're not automatic. 
God's promises are often conditional. He wants us to ask for them. He says, come to me and plead with me for these things and I'll do them to you, do them for you. Why often does Jesus show us in the Gospels someone like a widow pleading with a judge and that being a reminder of how we're to come to God in prayer. We're to come to the Lord, acknowledging our weakness, bringing to him this promise and praying, Lord, would you grant to me this kind of energy, this kind of strength, so that in my weakness, I can know your power and I can do all of the things that you want me to do. It may not come at that very moment. In fact, often it doesn't. God sometimes wants to test his people. Do we really believe what we're praying? Are we ready to wait? Do we believe that God and his goodness at some point in the future will come and fulfill that promise in our lives? So with eager expectation, we wait and there's a longing in our hearts that God would raise us up and help us. And then when God in kindness comes and grants to us the strength and the energy that we need, there's a readiness on our part to do what God has called us to do, whether it be entering into worship with joy and eagerness, giving ourselves to prayer, offering ourselves in evangelism, Lord, give me opportunities to share about Christ, taking up works of service in the church, doing what the Lord has called us to do. I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, do I really believe this? I think too often we come with excuses. Oh, this couldn't be me, I'm, I'm, I'm getting too old. This couldn't be me, I've got a health problem. Uh, this couldn't be me, my life is so full, I, I, I can't do anything more for the Lord. This couldn't be me, we, we've got it. excuses. Why this promise couldn't be me. Why I could never be the person mounting up like an eagle. Unbelief is certainly the greatest hindrance to our experiencing the promises of God. Unbelief that this could really be me. But brethren, like God said to Israel, prove me. Prove me. I've made the promise. Now prove me. Come and ask for it and wait on me and see if I'm not faithful to my word. We say we believe that God is a faithful God. We say we believe that he always keeps his word. We say that God is true, that he couldn't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. But then we look at the promise and say, oh, I think I'm past <coughs> This couldn't apply to me. Brethren, do we believe that our God is the God of Isaiah 40? That he's this great God who <coughs> gathers up the waters in the palm of his hand. He's controlling all things. He's Lord over human government. He's bringing the stars out each night. And he's promising to me and to you that he can strengthen us with all that we need as we live in his Lord. Oh, brethren, may we be living illustrations that God keeps his promises. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we all know the reality of human frailty and weakness. We experience that often. 
and we know that it impacts our perseverance, our zeal, our enthusiasm, sometimes just for life itself, but especially for you and for the cause of your kingdom, for the name of our Lord Jesus in this world and his great salvation. Oh, Father, please come and help us. We need this promise. We need your strength. We need to be able to serve you. We need to do the things that you've called us to do. We want to be a people who are on fire for Christ. We want to be a people who, like those early disciples, were turning the world upside down. Lord, please. Help us to be coming to you and asking you over and over again that you would work out this promise in our lives, that we might be like those spiritual eagles, that we will be people running, running in your service, running for Christ's cause and not being weary. Lord, we know that this cannot be attained by human means. But it is something that you and your unlimited power can do. Father, we pray that you would fill us up for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.